often is well fed but still kind of asleep, uh, kind of awake. Apparently, I'm asleep. Um, yeah, I have the pleasure to, uh, to talk about what the BioPython community has been up to in the last year. That's quite a bit of ground to cover. So, BioPython is essentially a collection of modules for biological computation. And uh, it, con it contains a lot of stuff uh, modules and classes for uh, dealing with sequences and um, annotations, motifs, different um, file form parsers. Uh, modules for database queries to all kinds of public databases, Uniprot, NCBI, uh, protein structures, tool wrappers, and a lot more stuff. And it's been uh, around for quite a while. So um, we started in 99, end of 99, first release in 2000. And of course, it's uh, openly licensed and available. Um, in a nutshell, uh, it's about 290,000 uh, lines of code more than 10,000 commits and uh, about 160 contributors. So quite a, bit, quite a big project. And you see here how the, uh, the code size has developed over the years. Uh, in the last 12 months, um, we, have, we had quite, quite an increase in contributors and uh, commits. So uh, compared to uh, the 12 months before that, you see a um, 28% increase in contributors and about 20% increase in, uh, in commits, which is quite nice. And um, these uh, graphs and statistics, they come from a website called OpenUp, which is a website that tracks all kinds of uh, open source projects and repositories. So it's kind of, it's a pretty cool website. So if you're working on a project, uh, check it out. And they even track individual contributors, so you can uh, see how your own contributions um, have been over the last couple of years. Um, yeah, if you put that number of contributors in a, on a slide, it's actually quite a bit. So these are all new contributors in the last year, and uh, I had to kind of decrease the font size a couple of times to make things fit, which is a nice problem to have. So we had a uh, release of BioPython 166 at the end of last year. Um, it contains extended plotting for uh, CAC pathways. So you have support for transparency now, which allows you to do nice plots like this. Um, there's a uh, Jupyter notebook that um, contains a lot more of these examples. We have uh, CKIO updates. So CKIO is a module for um, sequence input and output in terms of seek record objects. So seek record allows you to represent a sequence and different annotations. And um, Eric worked on uh, extending the uh, ABIF format parser to, um, to decode a lot more of the, uh, the fields in the format. So now you can extract voltages, temperatures, all kinds of stuff. And uh, you can take a look at the spec to see what you can get out of that. With BioPDB updates, which is a class for, um, as the name suggests, working with uh, protein structures, um, there's a new uh, superimposer module that allows you to uses a new algorithm to, um, to uh, superposition two structures on another. Um, there's a few more of those um, superimposes in the already available. So this is an additional one. We have updates for the um, Entrust support, which provides um, access to NCBI. And um, there's an implementation of the um, citation matching function now. So you could basically, um, specify a few um, fields of a publication and it essentially gives you the PubMate ID, which is kind of nice. So it's a good module for uh, batch querying of NCBI. And of course, we have the miscellaneous stuff, the occasional bug fixes everywhere, test suite enhancements, better style. And uh, this release actually deprecates Python 2.6, um, which will be the support will be removed in the, or will no longer be supported in the, in the near future. So um, there's still quite a few CentOS uh, installations out there that have this, this older Python version. So we kept the support around for quite a while. And uh, these are the contributors. Everyone marked with an asterisk is a new contributor. So we have quite a nice mix of, of new contributors and, and kind of recurring ones, which is nice. 
So um, we had a new release last month by Python 167. And one of the most visible changes perhaps is the, um, that we deprecated the ability to compare seek record objects um, with the equality operator. And what this basically did was compare to seek records of basically object identity, which is kind of obvious to, to a computer scientist maybe, but uh, if you have biologists who come new to the field who want to write scripts, um, work with this, then you can get pretty surprising results. So even when you have two seek records that are completely identical, completely identical attributes, you would get false on that comparison, um, which is maybe not the smartest thing. So we deprecated that. You get an exception if you use it. Um, although we discovered yesterday that apparently there's a few side effects that we have to, to document better. <laughs> There's a new module, Biophenotype, for working with uh, phenotype microarray data. You can parse uh, the data. You can have access to the raw and interpolated um, data. You can fit your curve to your data, the different ways of uh, curve fitting to the data, um, extract parameters, and then write these, uh, these plate record objects as, as JSON, which is compatible with other tools out there. We have support for uh, restriction enzymes, so you can do in silico digestion of, uh, of sequences. And the um, list of restriction enzymes was updated to the latest release of Rebase. So this is a name you will see uh, quite a bit in the, coming, in the coming slides, actually. He has been quite, quite active in the last couple of months. Uh, we have a module called Biodata, which contains all kinds of um, codon tables, RNA, DNA alphabets, um, protein alphabets, and uh, various useful bits. Um, and we updated the uh, NCBI genetic code table to release 25. BioSQL is still around. It's an uh, SQL schema for biological sequence databases. Um, available on this website. It's uh, common to basically all the, the bio projects, BioPerl, BioJava. And um, there were updates to, to the support to uh, use foreign keys in SQL3 databases. And of course, the uh, miscellaneous bug fixes, especially in the bio entries and, um, and structure parses. Uh, Tested enhancements, PEP3, uh, PEP8 style, of course. And these are the contributors again. Again, a very nice mix of, of new and established. So now with uh, BioPython 166 and 167 out, uh, we are, of course, looking at the new release, which will hopefully be out sometime in the near future. Um, and this contains a new or a rewritten uh, bio pairwise 2 module for uh, local sequence alignments. So it's faster, it addresses some problems, it allows more gaps or allows for gaps um, in more ways. Um, again, Marcus did this. Um, so BioPython is not only a, a collection of modules, but we have some um, some tools as well that kind of show how to use the, um, the library. So SeekGUI is one of those. And it's basically uh, an example tool that allows you to do um, simple um, nucleotide uh, transformations. So you can do transcription, back transcription, and these kind of things. And it was written in the early 2000s, and it was quite a bit of bit rot. So um, that was updated to use a new interface library. And uh, following NCBI, uh, we enabled access via HTTPS rather than HTTP. So more uh, bio PDB updates. Um, maybe you saw the poster, uh, the poster out there about the new MMTF format. So it's a compressed binary format for uh, crystal structures. And um, the author actually provided support for that in the BioPattern library, which is quite nice. 
So you can essentially um, read in local files, you can uh, query um, PDB for these structures, and you can use all the normal tools that you could use in, uh, in BioPython for, for working with these, including the uh, QSP uh, superimposer model that I mentioned earlier. Um, we updated the uh, NCBI code tables again to up to release 26. So that's what's happened in the, in the development version so far. And um, a couple of years ago, we introduced Docker images for um, the basic Docker images that contain Python 2, 3, and um, all free dependencies to make it easier to, to kind of get started with the whole thing. Um, there was a Bioscale container as well, I think with uh, SQLite 3. And all new, we have um, Jupyter Notebook containers. So we have a basic version and we have a version that includes uh, the BioPython tutorial as, uh, as notebooks. So it's a lot nicer to interactively learn how to, how to use the library. So one of my pet peeves when uh, I came to the project in 2012 was uh, style. And uh, Python has this nice PEP8 standard. And uh, so when I came in 2012, I ran the, uh, the PEP8 checker tool on the whole code base. And essentially, you got thousands and thousands of, uh, of style violations and errors. It was, it was interesting to see. So. Uh, <laughs> So we've, we've made a huge effort to, um, to kind of reduce these, uh, these style violations. So essentially, every module in Python had, had its own kind of local style. So we had a large clean, uh, cleanup effort. We, uh, we tried to introduce a uh, pre-commit um, git hook to kind of check for new violations, um, which had the problem that everyone who actually commits has to install it locally. So if you don't opt in, then you then no one uses it. So we try to, to automate the style checking via Travis now, which will hopefully be um, enabled in the near future. So we can kind of successively eliminate more and more style violations. So the list of supported uh, Python versions goes from Python 2.6 to Python 3.5, with the deprecations of 2.6 and 3.3. Uh, as mentioned. Uh, we also support PyPy and uh, Jython. So we also played around with continuous integration a little bit more. So we've been using Travis CI, of course, like probably have most people on GitHub. And um, we experiment, there's different services out there you can tie into that. So there's uh, CodeCoff, which gives you test coverage um, there's quantified code, which uh, gives you all kinds of metrics about your code and even allows you to do, enable automatic pull requests. So it suggests its own kind of changes and style violations and so on. Um, so we played around with that a little bit, but that got a bit problematic because it would send pull requests that would not work on Python 2.6, for example. So um, we might want to revisit that when, when Python 2.6 is, is phased out, maybe. Um, there's also Landscape I.O., which uh, gives you its kind of health score, um, which is kind of an aggregated score of uh, you know, code smells and, and um, style violations, other errors. So it's quite nice, actually. So currently enabled as code cuff and, uh, and quantified code without the pull requests. Uh, we are also forced to essentially write a new website. Um, maybe you heard yesterday that the uh, OBF uh, had server problems, so all the bio projects basically had to migrate. Um, so we migrated from the media wiki to uh, GitHub pages, so everything is kept in Git now. Um, it's pretty basic, but it gets a job done. And so if you have any, if there's any web developer out there who wants to to uh, make things more beautiful, then there's the repository. Um, so, last 12 months, we had lots of new contributors. We had a lot of new stuff in the releases. Um, I hope we can turn new contributors into recurring ones, kind of in line with the discussions yesterday at the panel. Um, 
and there will be BioPython 1.6.8 in the near future, hopefully. So I would like to thank um, Peter, of course, as a herder of cats in BioPython, and the whole BioPython community for allowing me to, to present here, and my uh, PhD supervisor in uh, Beckenlund and the Faculty of Medicine for making sure that I would actually make it over here in terms of funding. And these are the, uh, the services that you use. Uh, resources, there's a website, repositories, mailing lists, uh, there's a Biostars category, we also on, uh, on Twitter, um, so check it out. Thank you very much. <laughs>